Ah, show me wax on, wax off. Wax on, wax off. Wax on, wax off. Hey, wax on, hat. Wax off, hat. Concentrate. Look at my eye. Like a hand. Thumb inside. Get! Get! Ladies and gentlemen, this is the main of the evening. Floor. Welcome in UFC 291. This is RJ Bell's Dream Preview. I'm AJ Hoffman. He is Sleepy J. What's up, Sleepy? How are you, my man? I'm doing all right. Nothing to complain about. Nothing to write home about, but <laughs> everything's pretty good right here. I like how, like, even if things are going good for you, it's like, eh, you know, I'm all right. I'm all right. Uh, it's a good week if you are a fan of prize fighting. Uh, as we have a couple real big fights this weekend, one, uh, well, more than one, uh, on UFC 291. Um, there's the the Bellator card that's that's going this weekend, and there's also maybe the the biggest boxing match of I don't, at least the last couple years, maybe uh, on Saturday night as well. So tons to get into. We will hit on that Errol Spence and Bud Crawford fight at the end but let's let's do the UFC 291 the way we always do we'll go through the uh the main event we'll look at the co-main event and then we will both have ourselves a best bet uh and let's start with the main event sleep this is a rematch from 2018 one of the best fights of 2018 uh between Dustin Poirier and Justin Gaethje uh, that fight was a late finish for Poirier, fourth round finish. And both these guys have, I would say, improved since that fight. Uh, Poirier is, I mean, obviously both these guys really are in nothing but big fights at this point in their career. Like they're, you know, they're not having rinky dink fights. These are, these are big time fighters. These are big draws. And I think everybody expects this to be, you know, a fantastic fight. Uh, odds pushing Poirier's way. Uh, he's up to minus 145 at DraftKings, minus 150 at Caesars. Uh, payback is 125 plus 125 on Gaethje. I'll let you take the lead on this one. How do you feel about this fight? And and how do you, who do you think comes out on top? I feel pretty good about this one. Interesting that the last two losses for both of these guys are to the same guys. It's Khabib and Oliveira. So at least they have that in common there. Oh, like the two best lightweights in like 10 years? Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. Both are coming off of wins. And now, you know, it's been a little bit over what? Like four years now since these guys faced off. I think the line's wrong. I, I actually do. I think it's now heading in the right direction. I got Poirier in this one for sure. I think Dustin is probably the more well-rounded fighter. I think giving him a second look can only probably help him here. I'm not sure how much a second look actually does for Gaethje. He kind of wants you in in more or less like a dogfight, in a phone booth. Not saying that Poirier won't go ahead and get into that type of a that type of a fight with him, but Poirier realizes if he's going to lose that that's probably the best pass possible for him to end up losing this fight. I think Dustin probably has the better chin the better ground game. I think Poirier is just a better all-around fighter. And I think he actually has a better chance of winning this fight than he did in the last fight. So I don't agree with the odds. I could see Poirier probably closing maybe somewhere around minus 170. So I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to play Poirier here. I think that that's definitely the right side. And I would probably get on this sooner rather than later as we're seeing that line kind of run away from right now. Yeah, I also bet Poirier. Uh, I bet it a couple days ago, minus 140. Um, this is, it, I, I agree with a lot of what you said about, you know, Dustin Poirier downloading that first fight and, and I think he only gets better because of it. Uh, I also love that Poirier is just so durable. Like he's been knocked out twice in his career and hasn't been knocked out since 2016. That's a long time. And Gaethje has good power, but the guys that he's been knocking out lately, are guys who have questionable chins like James Vick and late career Donald Cerrone. That certainly 
doesn't apply to Dustin Poirier. Uh, I, I like Poirier. I also like... <laughs> I like the over in this fight. I think this is a, it's a two and a half rounds. You pay minus one twenty five to the over. This is a fight between guys who who know each other and who I, I think are smart enough not to just you know throw caution to the wind. And both of these guys are looking for it, it, the winner of this fight gets back into title contention. The loser of this fight is it might be out of it for good. So I think that they're both going to be cautious. The other factor, the one factor really that concerns me a little about Poirier, uh, but makes me kind of like the over, is the elevation factor. And fighting the, fighting in Salt Lake City, uh, this is it, it, Gaethje obviously trains in Colorado, so it's not a big deal to him. Poirier trains in Florida. It's gonna it's gonna affect him, and he got out there early, but it's still you know it's still hard to adjust to that. But I think Poirier is smart, and I think he is going to conserve energy. I don't think he's going to let it be. He, I don't think he's going to let it turn into a one round fight. So over two and a half, I like even more than Poirier. What do you think about uh, how how long this fight goes, and how how do you see it finishing for Poirier? I think if it ends in the first round, it's probably Gaethje that ends up here with the win. I mean, you might be right. I think the longer that Poirier drags this out, I actually think that his gas tank is going to be a lot better than than Gaethje because Gaethje's throwing a lot of bombs. I mean, how many fights have you seen him in where you know he's throwing those haymakers and he's swinging at nothing but air, and eventually that kind of gasses you out. Poirier seems like he's the more collected fighter, and when he you know decides to go ahead and make his moves and do the, you know whether he's going for takedowns or throw punches, like he's not just out there. You know, swinging for the fence is hoping and praying he hits something, and I think that that certainly helps his gas tank out. So I think he comes into this one probably with a more caution type of approach, being like, I don't need to waste everything. As you just said, you know, going from basically Louisiana, Florida, I mean, you're at the at the bottom of sea level there all the way to the top. That's probably going to be one of the first things, you know, that he tries to make sure that he has locked in is let me just not go out there and gas myself out, really pace himself, so would be with you more than against you, you know, with this going over. All right, let's take a look at the co-main event. Jan Blahovich, former champion, former light heavyweight champion, uh, taking on Alex Pereira, the former middleweight champion who is now moving up. And surprisingly, I mean, I guess when you just hear the former middleweight champion taking on the former light heavyweight champion, you would think that Blahovich is going to be the bigger man. I don't know if that's going to be true. I've seen some pictures of Alex Pereira, And he is absolutely massive. Like, he was obviously just draining himself so much to get to 185. He's going to be a huge 205 as well. And I'll I'll lead off with this one. I like Jan Blahovich in this fight. Typically, Blahovich wants to use that Polish power, and he he wants to go in and, and put his hands on you. But when he's been faced with opponents who he doesn't think he has a striking advantage against. And the most memorable one is obviously Adesanya, Israel Adesanya. When Adesanya moved up and tried to become a, a, du- a dual weight champ, what did Blahovich do? He wrestled him, wrestled him, wrestled him. He beat him basically exclusively with wrestling. And Adesanya is a better grappler than Pereira. Uh, it, of course, pereira has got that left hook. It is a, a a time bomb. It is absolutely scary, and it's even scarier because Blahovich is an orthodox fighter, which means that uh, he he doesn't have that shoulder to protect him from that shot. Um, but I think it's also important to remember that Pereira's moving up in weight, and it was just a couple months ago that he got knocked out, and it was an ugly knockout, like crushed by Adesanya. And this is a really quick return. It's a a really quick move up in weight. Uh, It feels like he's coming back too soon. And the matchup just to me favors Blahovich because his his grappling is so, it can be so strong when he needs it to be. And Pereira is a weak defensive grappler. Um, I I think having a a bigger man like Blahovich on top of him is going to be problematic for him, despite all the, all the sides he's put on. I just think that the, the, that part of his game you know, he's such a great kickboxer, but that, that grappling part of his game is so far behind because he's, I mean, realistically, he's new to MMA, uh, you know, at least 
uh, comparably to to what Jan Blahovich and Israel Adesanya and these guys are. This guy was a kickboxer who's converted, and I, I think Blahovich is smart enough to take advantage of that. Uh, I, I think he keeps Pereira on the ground for much of this fight and probably gets a finish there. What what are you seeing in this fight? Well, I like what you said there when you said that you thought that Alex was coming back a little bit early. I kind of felt the same way too. I thought maybe he probably would come back, you know, maybe like September, October, somewhere around there. I thought I, I certainly think he's coming back a little bit early. This was probably one of the tougher fights that I had to handicap probably in a while, and I really couldn't pick uh, a guy here. I felt like as I was looking at it, it was a 50-50 fight. And I also started to think, like, this potentially could be maybe like the letdown of the card. And the reason I say that is because I don't think either of these guys are going to have a problem standing toe-to-toe, standing straight up in front of each other, probably trading bombs. So a first-round KO, that was certainly a wager I was looking at. That wouldn't surprise me. I guess maybe I could make a case for both fighters, you know, how this fight could potentially go, you know, some of the wagers here. Well, it, it's certainly my, it's minus 110 both ways, so the, the betting market agrees with you that it's a, a coin flip fight. I just see some stylistic advantages there for Blahovich. I think with me, I couldn't get past, you know, the recent Jan Blahovich resume. And when I looked at kind of what's gone on with him, so he takes on Ankalaev, and that fight ended in a draw. And even Jan came out and he was like, you know, I acknowledge that I lost that fight. He actually did it on TV. And I agree that Jan probably should have lost that fight. And then he goes and he fights Rasik, and he ends up blowing out his ACL in like the third round. I don't know who was winning that fight at that particular time, but it was another win, you know, for Jan that that technically wasn't a win. The odds suggest that Rasik was probably the better fighter in that one. I think he was like a minus 200 favorite. And then he goes and he fights Glover, and he loses that fight. Now he beats Izzy, but... Izzy was trying to become what champ champ he was moving up and wait so yep. that was a little bit crazy and I think you probably are agreeing with me here that that Izzy fight was going into the fifth round it was basically a tie like whoever won that one I mean that was they were going to win that fight oh I disagree I, I thought I thought Jan was he I thought he controlled that fight I was kind of on the opposite side of you there then. I thought whoever won that fifth and final round was certainly going to end up winning that one. But Jan did his job in the fifth. I mean, he got Izzy down, and and that was pretty much a wrap there. So I do question some of the wins and losses over Jan's, probably like his last five or six fights. And I just wonder how much tread's left on the tire. So I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to take Alex on this one, and it's not strong. I I feel the same way that the odds are, like it's 50-50. So that's where I'm going to go ahead and, and sit here with this one. I'll, I'll take I'll take Alex. All right. Where are you going to go for your best bet? What's your what's your favorite play on UFC 291's card? This is a stack card. I'm going to be pretty boring here, AJ. I'm going to just go ahead and give out Poirier as my best bet. When I looked at this card now, there's a lot of prelim fights out there that I could probably make cases for. As I just mentioned with the Alex fight and Jan, I was really 50-50. But the Poirier fight was the one that stuck out to me most. Because the odds, when I looked, I'm like, these are wrong. And now it's starting to run in the direction of Poirier. And I think that that's the right side to be on. So this is my favorite fight. I think that this warrants a best bet for me. I'm probably going to end up putting like three stars on this one. So I'll make that my best bet. And then one of the prelim fights, since it's kind of short here, I'm not really giving you a best bet. We already talked about that one. Uh, I do like Roman Kopilov to go ahead and take care of Claudio Ribeiro. Um, you mentioned this one to me before we went ahead and started doing the podcast that maybe inside the distance was the way to go, that you can get some plus money on that. I agree with that. To go the distance is minus 280, so they're projecting that is not going to go the distance, and that Coppola is probably going to win this one. So there's a wager as well that you guys should consider, but I'm going to go ahead and give out Poirier my best bet. All right, for my best bet, I'm going to look at – Gabriel Bonfim and Trevin Giles, uh, and I'm going to go under a round and a half when you get that minus 125. I think this is going to be one of the most fun fights on the card. Uh, Bonfim is really an elite prospect, uh, unbeaten, and he comes he comes right at you, pressure striker, uh, but it's all to set up takedowns. And once he is on the ground, he is a venomous grappler. Like he he can finish you from all over the place. That's the goal for him. And Trevin Giles is a guy who is really well-rounded. And at times, like at his best, he looks like he could be a a real contender. Uh, The problem is 
he is not great with fight IQ. It doesn't seem like it seems like there's a mistake that he makes somewhere along the way, almost every fight and it costs him. And I, I think against someone as opportunistic uh, on the mat as Bonfim, you really can't afford to make a mistake. And if, you know, the, the, on the other side of that coin, if Giles looks like a contender and he catches Gabriel Bonfim coming in with the, like, again, kind of recklessly the way he tends to, uh, and he can catch him with something under one and a half still cashes there. So I, I tend to lean towards Bonfim winning this fight. I don't like the number that you'd have to lay for that. Uh, but I do like this fight to be over quick. I, I think both these guys are capable of finishing quickly. And, and I think Trevin Giles has historically shown uh, that he can be finished just out of nowhere. So I'm going to go under one and a half rounds, uh, minus 125 in Bonfim and Giles for my best bet. Uh, Sleepy, before we get to the uh, the Errol Spence and Bud Crawford fight, why don't you give the people a little way to save some money at pregame.com? All right, easy way to save some money here at pregame.com. Go on to Google, type in pregame.com, and you guys can go to A.J. Hoffman's pro pick page. He has his college football up. He has his NFL up. You guys can go ahead and get 20% on that. Enter code BMF20, BMF20. A.J., what's BMF stand for? I'm not sure. They keep saying the BMF title is on the line. I don't know exactly what that means. It's, uh, I don't, I don't know. Balding men (laughs) fighting. I don't, I'm not sure what it means, but, uh, there that's, that's the code BMF two zero is your code for 20% off anything at pregame.com. All right. Again, I I mentioned at the top that, that was, there's not only one big fight, going on this weekend because the biggest fight in boxing this this year I would say going on the same night unfortunately like at the same time which is so frustrating uh but you know who's going to complain it's it's there's good there's good fight sports on uh I'm never going to complain about that Errol Spence and Terrence Crawford for the unified finally a four belt welterweight champion uh right now the 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 money's pushed in on terrence crawford he's up to anywhere between minus 145 and minus 150 right now uh on spence you're getting back anywhere from plus 120 to plus 140 uh so shop around for that and the uh 10 and a half round uh total is set at minus 270 if you think this goes over 10 and a half rounds, uh, plus 200. If you think it's under 10 and a half rounds, sleepy, I'll let you take the lead on this. Uh, these are two guys who I I think people have been clamoring to see go at it for a long time. We finally get it. Uh, what's your take? Who who do you think comes out on top here? Well, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to bet with my heart here. And I'm also going to bet with what I've seen probably over like the last seven to 10 years. So I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to take Errol Spence the dog here. You know, I've been watching him probably for like 10 years now, and I've been a big fan of his for quite some time. As far as like who the better fighter is, I honestly don't know. We're going to find out for sure, but I'm going to go ahead and make a case here against Crawford. And what it might say might actually upset some of the Crawford fans and backers, but Terrence Crawford hasn't fought anyone. He hasn't beaten a classy fighter in his career as of yet. I think his resume is probably pretty much borderline trash. Yeah, he beat Sean Porter, and he stopped Sean Porter, but Porter was retiring. Spence took it to Porter two years prior and softened Porter up a lot. Crawford, he also beat Kel Brook. Brook was basically a retiring fighter when he fought Crawford because Spence battered him like two years before Crawford got at him, and he actually like he pretty much broke his face in that fight. I'm not even sure if Amir Khan actually even counts, you know, for Crawford's resume. I mean, he fought him in 2019. Yep. Khan was pretty much done back in like 2012 when he yep. fought Danny Garcia. I mean, he was pretty much just a shot fighter. And I get it, like Crawford needed names on his resume, but the quality of those names when he fought them, they were drastically deteriorated. Crawford, up to this point, I don't think he's actually fought a good quality, classy fighter 
who had plenty of gas left in the tank. And I get it, it's true, not many people wanted to fight Crawford. That's a valid point, but it's not like people were exactly lining up to go ahead and fight Spence either. When Spence took all his fights, he took on guys who legit had a shot to either get into the title fight or to at least be like a top contender, or they were a top contender. Everyone online right now is talking about, you know, Crawford stopping Porter. And you know what, like kudos to that. But prior to the 10th round in that fight, the Crawford-Porter fight, that fight was actually very, very close. And again, you know, Porter was retiring. Porter's father threw in the towel. Porter was dazed. I think he probably could have ended up finishing that fight. Uh, it's not like he was flatlined. And look, I mean, if you're going to retire and your father's your, your, your corner man and you just got knocked down twice and you're showing frustration, I mean, I can get it why he kind of threw in the towel there. I mean, it just makes sense. Like the, the father was trying to go ahead and protect his son. But the one thing about Spence, and, and I could say that th that Crawford really doesn't have this experience, is that Spence has been in the trenches with every fighter that he's been in there with because a lot of those guys were kind of in their prime. You got Ugas, Danny Garcia, Sean Porter, Mikey Garcia, Ocampo, Kel Brook, uh, Lamont Peterson, Algeri. Maybe not Peterson. I mean, Peterson was probably on the decline a little bit. But that's the experience factor that Spence has that Crawford does not have. Spence has been in the trenches with the best guys at their best times, and Crawford hasn't. And I don't particularly understand all the money coming in on Crawford. And I think the reason why this is happening is because if you look at how these guys fight, Crawford is the flashier fighter. Like if you, Spence isn't exactly like a Floyd Mayweather type of guy who has like these cat-like reflexes. Crawford does have those type of skills. But I think when it all comes down to it, it's going to be the deep waters. Spence is going to be there. He's been there before. He's going to drag Crawford in there. I think that's where Crawford might crumble. So, yeah, I'm betting with my heart, but I'm also going to bet with experience, and I'm going to take a look at the resumes and really match them up. And it's telling me Spence is the far better fighter here. So I'm going to take Spence. Yeah, I'm also surprised to see the money flowing in the way it has on, uh, on Bud Crawford, who, listen, I, th I think Crawford's really good. And uh, you're right. Like the, the resume is, is not, you know, out of this world. This is, I mean, this is certain, this is the toughest fight for either guy period. Uh, and I, I think like you mentioned the, the Garcia win for Errol Spence, that was a, a, a lightweight moving all the way up to welterweight. And, we got to remember Terrence Crawford started as a well as a lightweight and he's moved up to welterweight. Errol Spence Jr. is the bigger man. He is the stronger man. And you'll hear a lot of people talk about the reach and things like that, because even though Errol's taller, uh, he, he Terrence will have a, a reach advantage. But I, I think like in, and you look at the speed, Crawford's the, the faster fighter. And if you look at the counter punching and the defense, Crawford's probably better. But I think that there's something to be said about the power for Errol Spence and the chin of Errol Spence, who's never been knocked down. Uh, Terrence Crawford has. And I, I think the body punching, the, the explosiveness of Errol Spence can really come into play in this fight. So I, I don't. No, I don't think it's a, a blowout either way. I really think, like you were talking about, you could see it going either way in the, the UFC uh, co-main event. I think this fight should really be minus 110 either way. Uh, so to me, getting Errol Spence, you can get him at plus 140. That feels, it feels way too juicy for me. This is a guy who has never lost, has never been an underdog before. Uh, and he's fighting, he's the bigger guy he's fighting, you know, Terrence Crawford's been at welterweight for a while, but Errol Spence is the natural welterweight. And literally every time people have expected Errol Spence to come out flat, he's done the opposite. Like, you know, when his, when he had the car wreck and he came back like a year later, people thought he was never going to fight again, came back a year later and dominated. Uh, then he had the detached retina. And, and he comes back and, and beats up Ugas. Like this guy is not a guy I'm willing to, to count out. So him being an underdog doesn't scare me either. Uh, plus 140 feels like a, a really good price. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm tempted uh, because 
it's if you want to juice it up a little more, you can get plus 600, uh, plus 650 in some places on spins to win inside the distance, win by TKO or KO. Uh, but I'll probably just stick with the 140. Um, you never know how these boxing judges are going to go either, which is a terrifying thought. But again, if I if I if I get down to a coin flip at the end and my coin pays plus 140, I'm probably pretty happy with that. So looks like we agree on this one. Uh, I, I'm 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 riding the dog on this. I, I think Errol Spence walks out of there with four belts. One more thing I wanted to go. There's a, a fight on the undercard that I wanted to hit quickly, uh, and. This, this should be a fun fight too. Nonito Denaire and Alejandro Santiago, which was supposed to happen a couple weeks ago. They move it to this card. Uh, I'm guessing, you know, a little, uh, slid them a little envelope and said, hey, why don't you guys train for a couple more weeks? Get on this big card. But Alejandro Santiago is plus 130 here. Donaire is 40 years old and coming off a knockout. I don't know, like, there's a good possibility that he's just done at 40 years old. What, it, it, Whatever it is, I'm certainly not paying minus 168 to see if he's got one more big, you know, big run left in him. Santiago is a nasty fighter. Uh, he is, he, he can, he can land some heavy shots. And he's been, like, of his three losses, it's all been by decision. And only one of them was a unanimous decision. And that's going, like, way back in his career. Like, there's been three draws, uh, a couple split decisions. Like, he's going to be in this fight. And considering Donaire is 40 years old, probably on the way out. Uh, I just talked about how boxing judging can be questionable at times. Why you want to give a guy a decision on the way out when you've got a, a younger, you know, younger guy who you can actually build up off of this win. So I might lay a little on Alejandro Santiago uh, at plus 130 in that undercard fight. I couldn't even imagine stepping in the ring right now at like 40 years old because, you know, I'm right around that age and I wake up in the morning and, you know, just cutting the grass sometimes feels like it's a chore. You know, as you do get, you know, near 40 and, you know, to be honest, you know, you do start to age and you do start to feel a little bit different. So I could only imagine how tough it is on some of these guys, not only to go out there and fight, but to go through the training camp and all that stuff like that. Like, you know, age does play a big factor. And, you know, being 40 years old, stepping in the ring scares me. Yeah, well, certainly, like you said, in training, like I, I, I fought my last MMA fight at 38 years old. And it, there's a real difference in how you're able to train and like, you go with the young guys in the morning and then they say, okay, we'll be back this, this evening. Let's do it again. And it's like, man, I need the rest of the day off. So it's a, it's a lot harder to, to train hard uh, when you get older than it is when, when you're a young buck. So I don't know, man, I, I'm not looking to lay a big price with a 40 year old man, uh, uh, particularly one who's just coming off a knockout loss. So I'll go ahead and add that to my card. Alejandro Santiago plus one thirty. Hey guys, if you enjoy our content and want even more videos from pregame.com, hit that subscribe button right now. I promise you, you will not find better sports betting information anywhere else.